Welcome everybody to the seventh weekly annual show and tell. Uh, show and tell is pretty simple. It's going to be just a half an hour long, and we're going to try to show like five to ten different projects. We're going to get to three to five minutes, so you do have to get to the point pretty quickly. Uh, we'll be calling on you sort of in a random order, so just be ready at all times to show your stuff. Um, if you don't have a project, uh, it's okay. You can leave the chat and watch us on YouTube. If you um, aren't showing something at the moment, at the moment now, now. Okay. Let's see you guys. Because otherwise we can hear it. Um, okay. First up is John Janier. Hey. How's it going, everybody? Yo. Oh. Hey. So uh, I wanted to show off my uh, this little steam engine that I made. Uh, last fall, <clears throat> because I know you guys have a lot of electronic projects, so this is strictly analog. Um, I took a machining course at a local college, and they wanted us to have us build a steam engine. And I looked at the plans and I said, "This looks too simple and doesn't look like it causes enough aggravation." So I want to make my own, and that's what I did. Uh, can you see? Yeah, I'm gonna tilt it down. There you go. There you go. I'll tilt it down. You're not gonna see me, but you'll see the steam engine. Um, it's not going to run because I, the compressor and the Wi-Fi don't really coexist in my house. So <laughs> I'm just going to spin it around. There's a video. I'll, I'll post the, my blog post afterwards <clears throat> with a link to it. But this uses what's called a Scotch yoke. Uh, most engines use what's called a crank and uh, rod, which is sort of angled. This is called a Scotch yoke because what happens is in this slot, I don't know if you can see that, there's a pin from a wheel, and the pin rides in the slot and causes the piston to move back and forth, or if the piston's moving in and out, it makes the wheel turn. Um, it's a little different than most engines, but I wanted to try it because it has some neat properties. Um, the way it works is, if you remember from math, when you go around in a circle, the X sort of traces out a, a X and Y both trace out sinusoids. So when you travel, you're basically traveling just in the X here. And so it's a perfect sinusoid, which also means that the position is a sinusoid, so the velocity is a sinusoid, because that's its first derivative. And then the acceleration is also a sinusoid, because that's the second derivative. So you get a very smooth acceleration curve, whereas with a regular crank arm, you get a lot of jittering. Uh, you know, there's stops and starts, and they're very abrupt. So this tends to be a little lighter. Um, you can build it a little lighter than a crank arm. You don't have to overbuild it to account for the extra forces. And uh, it's also much more lightweight, so you can use a smaller piston and move the same mass. So uh, I don't know if I spoke too fast, but uh, that's about it. That's great. How long did this take you to make? Um, this took me about, I would say, three months. Um, I had limited shop time. I was only able to get about eight hours of shop time a week. Okay. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> there's always there's always going to be some type of noise. Yeah. Are you so, planning to make a Sterling engine after this, or are you gonna? Is this like your engine? You're done engineering. I'm actually uh, I'm working on another engine, another steam engine. I would like to build a Sterling at some point. Uh, I just haven't really. I've sort of been in the in the steam mode, thinking of you know a fluid flow, which is basically the air. Sterling engines are a little more, you have to be a little more careful because you're dealing with very narrow temperature differentials because it's basically hot air to cold air. So your precision has to be a little bit better and um, you have to have tighter tolerances on it. I know for the shop class at MIT they build a Sterling engine. It's beautiful. Um, but I, I'm not really, I don't really have that kind of access. So I'm sort of thinking about it. What type of machines? What type of machine um, are you using to to make a majority of this? Uh, I did this sort of a mix of uh, a manual mill, a manual lathe, a CNC mill, and a CNC lathe. So it was sort of equal parts one and the other. Some of the parts, like this Scotch yoke, that part right there, which I don't know if you can see it, but it's it's yeah. that was CNC machine because that's a little too precise for me to be able to do, and particularly these outer radiuses are a little too difficult for me to do by hand. And this part right here, the, the main part, which I actually patterned after the Starship Enterprise. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. I'm like, I want to make this engine that looks like the Starship Enterprise. So it's got these compound curves in it. 
and it's very difficult to do that by hand. Uh, because yeah. you have to keep re resetting where the piece is, and you have to find the center of this circle, and then you have to put it on what's called a rotary table and rotate it around. And if you if you make one mistake, the whole thing is done. With the CNC machine, it's a lot easier. So. And uh, what software tool tools did you use to design the uh, the the digital side of this? Uh, to do the drafting, I used um, I started with AutoCAD, and I switched to this program called DraftSite, which is a 2D drafting program by Dassault Systems, or the people who make SolidWorks. And they actually, that software is available for free. Um, and I'd love to continue using it, but they upgraded it, and now it won't run on my machine. So I'm in the process oh, yeah. of, yeah, I'm in the process of cleaning up the drawings because I want to release the drawings so anybody who wants to make this can make it. But I've had some trouble because the software doesn't seem to run properly. And, and to write uh, the team, I'm sorry, sorry. go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, will you be able to post some of this up on the Adafruit blog? Yeah, as soon as I have proper um, documentation for it, I will. Oh, uh, right on. Yeah, without drawings, I really couldn't. I, I have some pictures, and I guess I could probably post those up tomorrow. Just sort of yeah, sure. follow if you want. But, yeah, uh, for the folks who don't know, John is one of the authors on the Adafruit blog. So it's, it's, good, to, it's good to see him. <laughs> yeah. And um, to, to write the G code, I used Emacs. So that was... Ooh. G-code is, is really simple. It's like logo, really, except yeah. you're dealing with um, metal that can fly off and hit you in the face. But other than that, it's just like logo. <laughs> <laughs> but really, all I right, mean, John. Well, thank thank you so much. We're gonna move on to right. the the next the next person. That was a cool cool project. I, I like your um your Star Trek aesthetic. <laughs> yes, yeah, thanks. All okay, right. next up, we're gonna. We're, it's like celebrity night here. Uh, Caleb. So unmute your mic, Caleb. Caleb Kraft Caleb. is uh, Caleb. editor hey. and a uh, author of Hackaday. Uh, yeah, thanks. Hi, everybody. Hey, um, boss. I kind of just kind of just ran into a problem here. Uh, I was going to show uh -oh. off in a, a project enclosure uh -oh. made out of stained glass. Uh, we're always seeing these project enclosures that people are 3D printing and and they're trying to do cool stuff with it. And we thought, why not make it pretty? So yeah. we we're going to do yeah. one out of stained glass, but my 100 watt iron just died. And I'm trying to use a 30 watt iron, and it's not really working that great. <laughs> I don't know if you can see this here, uh, yeah. right yeah. here. This is a, it's part of a chassis for a treaded vehicle. It was supposed to be stained glass. I'm kind of, I can't tell the colors here on the screen here. But I have like, you know, just green and purple and different pretty colors of stained glass, and just trying to do something a little bit different here, uh, a little different than the normal. And that's yeah, it. I saw, I saw a really, I saw a really cool, project cool project a while ago that um, it was an electronics. So, uh, the pyramid, the glowing pyramid. Maybe it was a glowing pyramid, but there, there was uh, someone who started to use stained glass, and I think that's like. like the next, the next, not steampunk, steam like, like church church punk or something. Or something. <laughs> the, 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 the next, the next um, enclosure, next way to make, to make stuff look stuff really cool. I'm hoping so. It, it's fun <laughs> uh, if your iron works. Um, are you going to put some LEDs inside of it and light it up when you're done, too? Well, the, the main chassis, I would hope so. I'm not going to be doing most of the electronics. Uh, one of the other writers at Hackaday will. Um, I tend to do more of the artistic and... and mechanical stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm going to kind of be a waste not to put some lighting in there, hopefully. Maybe an EL panel behind it all, one of the white panels that you guys just got at Adafruit yeah, would work yeah. really well, I think, behind some stained glass. Uh, that's kind of what I was thinking. Um, but it's cool. Futuristic, like, gothic like, enclosures. <laughs> I like Neo-Victorian. Yeah, that's, yeah, a, that's good a good one. For the name. So that's all right, it. Well, 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 We'll look for your post on Hackaday, and we'll post it up on um, Adafruit as soon as uh, we see if you go live. Is it going to be a video for your awesome new video series? I don't know. I don't know. We're just kind of testing those out. They seem to be doing okay, and it kind of depends on uh, if the person that does all of the electronics for this and stuff follows through after I make the body. You never know with a team of people who's going to complete what and who's going to do what, so we'll just have to see. But... I'll certainly be sharing, hopefully, project enclosures using stained glass on Hackaday. 
um, with my Arduino and maybe some local stuff here that I've done, even though I'm not as great as some of the other writers. Uh, that's it. Excellent. Well, thank Excellent. you so much well, for sharing. We look forward to seeing it. All right, thanks. Okay. Last week. Last week. <laughs> All, right. All right. Next up, Kevin Osborne. Kevin, if you could unmute your mic and show us your Hi. project. Can you hear me? Hello. Hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Hi. Uh, so this is a, um, I, I, I did make this a while ago. It's, a, uh, it's an Arduino uh, MIDI theremin. And it uses uh, one of these Maxbotics uh, USB, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, sonar distance sensors. Uh, and actually, it, it, it's not going to do anything impressive right now because it's actually sending out MIDI control chain signals. And I don't have it hooked up to the synthesizer. but. Uh, uh, I, I have swapped out. I was going to swap out for the uh, note playing, but uh, uh, I didn't have time. Um, uh, the, the, the cool thing is that I replaced uh, the uh, bootloader on the, or not the bootloader, but the uh, firmware on the uh, USB chip on the Uno so that it'll talk. I use the um, uh, Mocha Lupa uh, uh, firmware, uh, which I found yeah. through, through the Adafruit forums. Uh, and so it works. It works really brilliantly. It's uh, you can use the regular MIDI library, the Arduino MIDI library, because it just talks to the serial port, and then the uh, Mocha Lupa library just converts that to the MIDI packet. So hold it, it up. Yeah, hold up the project. Oh, we don't see this thing. So can you see it? Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah I just use uh, you know, a, 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 um, one of the uh, prototyping boards, and uh, it has an on-off uh, switch to, so that when you're not uh, when you're doing other things, you don't, don't generate signals, so that's it. I think this is cool. We're starting to see a lot of music stuff with the Uno because you can do this hack where you can turn it into basically a MIDI instrument. I think last week there was the... Um, the Air Harp. Yeah, the Air Harp. Um, and then uh, this. This is really exciting. This is like the unintended use. I don't think... I mean, the Arduino team just kind of put this out there where things could be hacked like this. And I think MIDI stuff kind of went away for a while, and now it seems like it's it's coming back because you can. There's so many people who do Arduino projects; um, yeah. they'll have access to sensors and they'll be able to pipe all that through. Yeah. They're they're trivially. Favorite. Yeah. And without the USB cable, I mean, I mean, you can use MIDI cables, but without like the MIDI to USB and USB to MIDI and the MIDI, you know, it's like there's a lot of cabling, and this is so much cleaner. You just plug it yeah. in. Yeah. So this is an ultrasonic theremin. Would that be the right yes. right term? Yeah, I, actually, uh, I, I played around a little bit too, and I, I did a version with uh, actually previously with just the regular MIDI. I, I used uh, one of the uh, SparkFun MIDI uh, boards. Uh, I used the uh, Sharp IR sensor, and I think it's actually it actually uh, feels a little better to play play that. Uh, I think the IR sensors are actually more appropriate for this. Uh, this this one has a little too wide a cone of. Uh, of, uh, so it, it's too easy to, to accidentally trigger it by standing too close to it. Oh, uh, yeah. So. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you so awesome. much, Kevin. Sure. We're going to keep moving along. Next up, I'm going to start over here. Uh, Andres. Andres. Hello. Unmute your mic and show yep. your project. Hello, everybody. My name is Andres. And, Hello. Uh, my project is essentially a, uh, what is it called, a laser-controlled wireless automatic cat feeder. <laughs> And I've yeah. seen, I know a lot of people uh, start their electronic uh, life building little gadgets like that. So this is kind of mine. I built this a while ago, and um, I haven't really worked on it very much, but uh, here it is. And let me just move the camera over here. And uh, let me just make sure. It's actually a relatively big contraption. <clears throat> uh, basically what it is is a metal container that has the food in it, dry cat food, and it is controlled by an Arduino, uh, or actually the container is sitting on um, a little uh, wheel right here, and this wheel is controlled by a motor, by, by a little uh, servo, which is then controlled by the Arduino. And the Arduino is right here. I don't know if you can, I mean, it's a little dark, but I think you can see yeah. the innards. Uh, <clears throat> when, um, when the Arduino receives the signal, actually it runs every three hours, and basically it's supposed to just turn. And essentially the reason why it's called a laser controlled is because the way I control when the 
the cylinder should stop turning is by a little laser right here that I have. And the laser basically is, um, is pointing to uh, a photoresistor right here in the back. I'm not sure if you can see it. And uh, whenever the little piece of wood blocks the signal, that's when it knows that it needs to stop. And the reason why I do that is because some people may put the cylinder in the wrong place, and so this is more of a, uh, a more intelligent way to, to manage it. Plus, it's really cool to do laser stuff, <laughs> you know, even if it's just a little laser pointer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so essentially, basically, um, it, it runs this way, and it also allows me to uh, do some wireless control. I, as you can see, I also had an XP... Uh, an XP device here, an XP module, which points to my little XP module here on my computer. I don't know if you can see it right here. And uh, this eventually allows me to control the device via a web interface. And so uh, if I am in my office, this little black box right here would, oops, I'm sorry, I, I'm not a videographer here, so. This, okay. box, this box right here would uh, indic would would actually show me video of um, of the cat box just via like a webcam on my computer. So it's not connected to the device or anything. It's just a webcam. So I would connect to the device via my uh, my web browser by clicking connect to feeder. And then if I just tell the device, oops, one second, if I just tell it, go ahead and feed them. I select the feed, and I send the command, and it goes ahead and runs it. And so I can basically tell it to feed it any time I want. And this was just uh, needed because my cats were getting too fat, so I needed to control how much food they <laughs> were getting. Um, and uh, other than that, that's that's basically it. it it's running on a Arduino Dual Minolove. Um, I want to upgrade it to the Uno in the near future, but um, uh, for now, that's what it is. And um, and it, uh, I just want to thank uh, Lee Moore so much for all the info that she put on her website because without it, I would have never been able to get this done. I mean, a lot yeah, of the information the cat, came the cat from your cat would starve to death. <laughs> yeah, my cats would starve to death. Yeah, basically, <laughs> or they would get too fat and explode. I don't know what, but. Uh, but it, it, essentially, a lot of the information came from from your site, so I want to thank you so uh, for for uh, putting all that out there for uh, for us to learn. <laughs> awesome! I like I like I, I can imagine like a cyber future where cats have like built in like XB or like Wi-Fi built in, and they're like like sending signals to like the Wi-Fi. Like eventually, they'll evolve to be able to communicate with XBs yeah. to get more food because the ones that have like better yeah, Wi-Fi built in, cats, then they'll get more food. Cats invented the internet to share pictures of themselves. I don't know if you knew that. Yes, it's true. I've heard right. that. I've, I've heard that. <laughs> All right, we're gonna try to get some more folks. Thank you so much for sharing this. That's an okay. intense project. All okay. right, Darren, Landrum, Landrum, Landrum. Yeah. Uh, let's Landrum. see. Can you hear me? Hey, Darren. Okay. Can you hear uh, me? Go ahead. Uh, Show your project. Show your project. Yep, we can hear okay, you. Okay, great. Um, I have to shift a few things around here real quick. Okay. This is my microphone right here. So, nice. <laughs> That's my sound card. <laughs> All right. You so, have a much better setup than we do. <laughs> well, I, I am I am an audio guy. I do music. So let me see. What can you see here? Unfortunately, the other problem is is this camera has a manual focus. So I don't okay. know if anything's in focus or not. But yeah, just put it put it in one spot, and then um, we'll try to focus like it. Pretty yeah. Good. Yeah, there you go. Uh, let me let me take a look at my video here. That looks good. I can get that in. Oh man! Oh, there it goes. Okay, I can get that in a little better focus. I think. Is that better? Yep. Yep. Okay. So this is basically it's an optical theremin. I mean, it's it's a bog standard circuit. You have. Here is the photo sensor. It's a CDS cell capacitor. Uh, so that's acting like the resistor. And then this is a uh, 40106 uh, inverse Schmidt trigger. And then this is acting as my speaker right at the moment because I don't feel like rigging a high impedance amp. 
And uh, the idea is I'm trying to figure out a way to make an optical theremin since every optical theremin I've ever seen uh, it strikes me as being kind of toy-like. It doesn't, it, it's not really playable like in a, in, a, in a purely musical sense. You can't put your hand at a certain position and get a specific note and expect that to be reliable. That's right. Yeah, so, so oh, shoot, sorry. Uh, I just kicked some cymbals. Um, so I'm trying to see if I can find a way to solve that. Uh, so let me see, here's my, oh, my only barely working flat. This is a dollar store flashlight, so. And uh, let me turn, oh, let me plug in the power first. I, my habit is to unplug everything at the end of the night. It's so. a good idea. Okay. Can you hear that? Yeah, we can hear it. So my idea is, if you can see it, here, let me see if you move that back a bit, is to put the light pointing away from the circuit and then reflect, reflect light yeah. off of my hand. It's not working very well here for some reason. Oh no, we can hear the different tones. I'll go ahead and shut that off. And get everything moved back, but either way, um, that is the, that's the basic idea that I'm kind of after there anyway. Very cool. Very cool. As you, as you, um, uh, progress with this, uh, post up in the forums or, or on Google Plus or um, send us uh, an email. I'd love to see mm -hmm. um, maybe some uh, videos of your first attempt, your later attempts, you know, all, as, as it gets better and better. That'd be really cool. Yeah, there, there is, um, you know, uh, theremins were originally just the capacitive impedance of a person, um, you know, as it approaches, like, it'll, it'll change the impedance, but then it depends on the person. You have to tune it, and like yeah. you know, they're very expensive. They're really good ones from like Moog. Um, and then people try different stuff, like um, uh, IR distance sensors are popular. Like you might have seen another yeah, person. Um, There's it, also um, ultrasonic, which is mm -hmm. also good um, because it doesn't depend on the light at all. And then there's um, light based, yeah. like doors, and, and there's also laser based. A lot of different options. Yeah, Roland has a uh, device called the D-Beam. The Roland D-Beam is, uh, is an infrared uh, transmitter-receiver combo that the idea being to kind of uh, uh, be immune to ambient light, which is kind of, that's kind of the problem I'm trying to solve, right, is, is issues with ambient light and also just to make it controllable. And yeah. I've, I've gotten better. I've gotten better results before than what you heard right there. Probably because I was juggling camera and microphone and all that at the same time. But uh, yeah, I think I think there's some promise here to make this work. Infrared would probably be a better option ultimately, just because then ambient light wouldn't really be an issue. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, you, you know, I don't, I don't have infrared. I don't have infrared. Sorry, I don't have infrared parts around here. I, you know, I have these parts. Yeah. So. Well, what you've got is definitely the simplest and most educational because you're actually there on the metal learning how, like, the CDS cell changes existence. So, mm -hmm. yeah, let's make it start. All right, we're gonna cool. move, we're gonna move on. We got a couple more people. We're gonna try to right. get through them fast. All Next right, okay. Philip Burgess. Hey Hello, there, Philip. I need mute you your mic so we can hear you. I did. Hello. You hear me? Yeah, you got a couple minutes. We're gonna try to get. Um, yeah, we can hear you. Uh, you got a couple minutes, and then we're going to try to get to the next person. How fast can you d show your project? Uh, pretty sure, pretty quick. You know the uh, the the digital RGB pixels. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. These aren't the ones you're selling, so I hope you won't kick me out. Uh, these are from another source, but the no, thing I'm fine. working on would no, probably no. probably work with yours as well. Um, I made a big array. I'm going to move my camera here. Uh, made a big array out of them. Um, 32 by 18, and don't know if you can see it oh, here, nice. but I got live video, uh, live video oh, going that's on, the, really uh, cool. on the array. You can see, let me put this up, 
there's the uh, the LEDs under there. Uh, I that just have paper over cool. it as, as a diffuser. Um, yeah, it's kind of, kind of washed out here, but it looks cool in person. Yeah, that looks um, great. That's how TV should be watched. <laughs> yeah, low res TV. Um, doing something funky here, though. Uh, most, you know, you might expect there's an Arduino between the computer and the LEDs, but uh, actually, I'm using a, a FTDI. Well, it's all glaring out there. Uh, yeah, FTDI adapter um, in Bitbang mode because there's just there's no love for Bitbang mode, and that's able to um, to drive the LED matrix very quickly, uh, 30 frames a second. Because uh, normally through the Arduino with serial, you just you couldn't get that kind of throughput. That's very yeah. You're definitely getting the raw USB. I mean, the the yeah. Bitbang FTDI. It's it's a little new because they didn't have a driver that supported it. I think until very recently. Um, but that's really cool. You should definitely post up some big photos because it's, again, it's going to be really hard to see it. Yeah, uh, all of I know what it's uh, look like, but uh, it's it's tough probably for anybody else to really see it in motion. Yeah, I'll update my uh, YouTube page. Uh, when yeah, I have please do, and send us a there. link. Um, send us a link, and we'd love to check check it out. Are you going to post any code down the road for anyone that? Oh, oh duh, yes. Oh, the code works. Uh, C and processing libraries. Uh, oh, great. Works on, works on Mac, Linux, and Windows. Oh, great. Um, uh, let us know where it's all at when you when it's up, and we'll uh, we'd love to post it. Maybe we'll have um, some people try to hack it and do stuff with our LED panel and our other stuff. and Yeah, I think it would be adaptable. Yeah, if you go to my site, uh, paintyourdragon.com. Uh, paintyourdragon.com. You, you can get links okay, from there to the GitHub, get the code, and have fun with it. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Philip. We're going to try to squeeze yeah. in one more person. Scott, I think you had some electronics I saw over there. Yep. All right. Howdy. So I had uh, uh, this old device from... Uh, Kits RS from 90, 1994, and it's a basic uh, little timer. And they discontinued this, and they don't make them anymore. And these chips you can't even get. So I wanted something that was very similar to this, which was a, a timer to help my kids uh, keep track of how long they have to do some chores. So I have, uh, let's see if the white balance will go. There we go. So this is basically the same type of circuit using two of the Texas Instruments uh, 5916s, which is the eight-channel constant uh, lead sync drivers. And basically, I'm trying to make this into a little, a simple kit, similar to the the little one that you could uh, used to be able to buy. And so instead of two chips, I'm actually converted over to use uh, the single chip from TI, which is the uh, TLC 5940. Let's see if I can get that straight enough. And it's just basically a little Arduino driving one chip, which is driving uh, the little dual digit uh, LCD or LED. Cool. So very simple. cool. Yeah. When you as you uh, as you progress with this, um, send you know post photos or send us a link or something, and we'll uh, we'll send people your way. This looks cool. Are you gonna make a kit to sell? Is that the is that the plan? Yes. Yeah, so the next stage is actually. Um, Boards actually should be done in two weeks, and then I'll actually have uh, some boards to play with, and I'll hopefully have a, a really small bomb. I'm trying to make it as small as possible and make it uh, you know very energy efficient so it can run off a 9-volt. Your breadboard looks like the fritzing stuff. It's that perfect. It's <laughs> <laughs> so look that's at that it. breadboard. This is what everybody's project should look like, by the way. <laughs> I like that right, color. So. Very simple. More colors? That's the only thing. I like okay. them. I like all the, all the wires. Well, more says more colors. I like so. to group them. All right. You can't, you can't please everybody. All, all right, right, Scott. We're going to uh, shut down everybody. You're welcome to stay in the Hangout, but we're going to start up Ask an Engineer in just one minute. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.